humans won't give up. Humans will keep on sending new missions. Humans will keep on improving technologies. And humans will eventually live on other places throughout the solar system and maybe even beyond. And that's just so important for all of our futures. Thank you.
After a decade in the making, NASA is just weeks away from launching its next mission to Mars. We are here today to talk about the Mars 2020 Perseverance rover and Mars helicopter. I'm Raquel Villanueva from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Southern California. I'm going to be your host today as we are getting closer to the countdown to Mars. Since we're social distancing, I'll introduce you virtually to the people who are working to get the rover to the launch pad. On our panel today, we have NASA Administrator Jim Bridesenstein. He will talk about how this mission will help pave the way for future human exploration. Planetary Science Division Director Lori Glaze will discuss NASA's strategy for exploring Mars. Deputy Project Scientist Katie Stack Morgan will tell us why we have chosen our landing site and what we hope to find there. Deputy Project Manager Matt Wallace will go over what makes this rover different from the previous rovers. Deputy Electrical Lead Luis Dominguez has an update on what we are doing on the spacecraft right now. And finally, NASA Launch Director Omar Baez will give us an update about launch preparations. We will start with NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine. Jim, can you believe we are only a month away from launch? It is. Uh, it's pretty amazing, and uh, what a great what a great time to to be at NASA. What a great time to watch all of the exciting things that NASA is doing. Um, and I'll tell you, you know, we 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 have to remember um, that NASA has an amazing ability to do stunning achievements even in the midst of difficult times. And you can see, um, I'm in my living room uh, in the midst of the coronavirus pandemic. I know all of us have been working over time, uh, working from home, working with our children in many cases out of school, um, and, and it's been a challenge, and, and we all know that. Um, but this mission was one of two missions that we protected to make sure that we were gonna be able to launch um, in July. And the reason that's important is because of the alignment. Uh, when you talk about Earth and Mars being on the same side of the sun, that, that happens once over 26 months, so it's it's very expensive if if we have to take perseverance um, and put it back into storage for a period of two years it could cost half a billion dollars and so this is an important mission for a whole host of reasons but what i really hope is that people watch this mission and that they are inspired um, that we know that we can strive and achieve even in the midst of, of very challenging times um, and so i think that's that's important um, Alex Mather, a seventh grader in Northern Virginia, actually named this little robot. I should, I should say big robot. We're talking about something the size of an SUV. Um, but he named it Perseverance. And I think right now more than ever, that name is so important. And I just want to thank Alex for giving us that name uh, because we are persevering and we are achieving even in the midst of these very challenging times. Um, and I also want to say that, you know, we're talking about Mars today. We have a big agenda. We have been given a directive to go to Mars with humans. And in order to achieve that, we're doing two things. Number one, we're building an architecture at the moon where humans are going to be able to sustain for long periods of time. And we're doing that under our program called Artemis. The other thing that we're doing is we're moving forward rapidly with these very important Mars robotic precursor missions so that one day when we send humans to Mars, we're going to know where to go to get the absolute best science and data that we can get. Um, and it, it's, not, it's not lost on me that 51 years ago on July 20th, I mean, this is important, 51 years ago on July 20th, uh, Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin were walking on the moon for the first time in history. And during that time, they did the first ever lunar return mission. And here we are with Mars Perseverance, 51 years later, getting ready to do the first ever Martian, I should say, Mars return mission. Um, so these, I think, are um, important milestones. Um, we've done it with the moon, now we're gonna do it with Mars. Uh, Perseverance is the first step in an eventual return of those samples. Uh, but I'll tell you the thing that has me the most excited as the NASA administrator is getting ready to watch a helicopter fly on another world. That's something that's never been done before in human history and here we are getting ready to launch Mars Perseverance with ingenuity, it's little helicopter, 
um, strapped to it. Um, I am very excited about watching a helicopter fly in another world for the first time in human history. And I know there's a great panel. You're going to hear great things about all of these different experiments and technology demonstrations that we have upcoming. But but we're very excited about Mars Perseverance, and um, and it's a great time to, to be at NASA. And I hope it's a great time for everybody to watch the stunning things that NASA is capable of doing. So with that, Raquel, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Jim. It really is an exciting first step. And for anyone watching who would like to submit a question, you can do so now by using the Ask NASA hashtag. Our phone lines are now open to the media, and you can ask a question by pressing star one. And up next, Planetary Science Division Director Lori Glaze will talk about how the Perseverance rover advances NASA's exploration of Mars. Thanks, Raquel. It is my pleasure to be here today as we begin our countdown to Mars and the launch of the Perseverance rover. At NASA, our vision for science is to lead a globally interconnected program of discovery that encourages innovation, positively impacts people's lives, and is a source of inspiration. And this mission does all of that. Perseverance is the most sophisticated mission we've ever sent to the red planet's surface. It's the next step in our historic Mars exploration program, which has been exploring Mars and unlocking its secrets for decades. And we couldn't be more excited about it. Some of Perseverance's main activities will be in astrobiology, which is the study of how life comes to be, the environments that can support life, and the search to see if life exists anywhere else beyond Earth. This is the first rover mission designed to seek signs of past microbial life by, by collecting and caching rock and soil samples that will be returned to Earth by future missions. The rover's instruments will also look for evidence of ancient habitable environments and monitor environmental conditions, which will help us better understand how to protect future human explorers. The rover will study the record that is preserved in the layers of rock on the surface of Mars, looking for those rocks that formed in water and could have preserved evidence of the chemical building blocks of life. The rover will also demonstrate a key technology for using natural resources in the Martian environment for life support and fuel, like producing oxygen from the carbon dioxide in the Martian atmosphere. Its landing technology and environmental sensors will also help inform future human missions to Mars. And just as Perseverance builds on past missions, it's also the first step in the first ever round trip mission to another planet in our solar system. Scientists have wanted a sample of Mars to study for generations. We have meteorites on Earth that came from Mars, but it's not the same as getting an actual sample of pristine Mars rocks and soil to study. And now, we're at a point where we can begin to attempt this amazing feat. Samples from Mars have the potential to profoundly change our understanding of the origin, evolution, and distribution of life on Earth and elsewhere in the solar system. Even now, NASA continues to study moon samples brought back by the Apollo program more than 50 years ago. We expect samples of the red planet to provide new knowledge for decades to come as we study them with state-of-the-art laboratory equipment we couldn't possibly take to Mars right now. The plan for Mars sample return is multifaceted and complex. This historic feat requires multiple spacecraft and our partners at the European Space Agency working together in a synchronized manner. Let me show you how. First, Perseverance is going to drill and prepare samples for return and cache them on the surface of Mars. In 2026, a fetch rover will be launched to collect those samples and bring them to a rocket that will launch them into orbit around Mars. Another orbiter will rendezvous and capture those samples for safe delivery to Earth. If it sounds complicated, it is. The technology to return the samples that Perseverance collects is maturing, 
but NASA's investments in developing autonomous robots and landing large payloads on Mars have laid the groundwork for a successful sample return campaign. We are thrilled to be working with the European Space Agency on Mars sample return and partners from Spain, Norway, and France on Perseverance Science as we take our next steps in exploring the solar system. So, you probably want to know more about how Perseverance is going to accomplish its mission. And for that, Katie Stack Morgan from NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory is going to talk about our landing site, which is a really special place on Mars. Thanks so much, Lori. So in just one month's time, Perseverance will begin its journey to Mars, specifically Jezero, a crater located on the inner rim of one of the largest and oldest impact basins on the surface of Mars, which you can see in this inset here. At Jezero, we'll have access to some of the oldest rocks in the solar system, between three and a half and four billion years old, as well as a record of diverse geologic processes, including volcanism, impact cratering, as well as processes associated with water, both at the surface and subsurface, that can tell us about how the planet evolved over time. We also think that Jezero was home to a variety of different potential habitable environments where perseverance can begin its search for the signs of ancient life on Mars. Specifically, Jezero is host to one of the best preserved deltas on the surface of Mars. Deltas form when rivers enter open bodies of water and deposit rocks, sand, and potentially organic carbon in the layers of that delta. Those layers are one of the prime astrobiology targets for the Perseverance mission. Also in Jezero, we see carbonate minerals around the inner rim of the crater. Carbonates can form in shallow lake margin environments, and based on what we know about carbonates here on Earth, we think those are another really important potential astrobiology target for the mission. We'll also have a chance to explore the crater rim, which exposes some of those oldest rocks in the field site, as well as some potential habitable environments that might have formed as a result of that impact event itself. At each one of these locations that Perseverance will explore, we'll be searching for biosignatures, patterns, textures, or substances that require the influence of life to form. Now we don't know for sure what biosignatures on Mars are going to look like, but we can look to our own Earth rock record to give us an example of what we might expect to find. What you see here is a 3.4 billion year old rock from Australia called a stromatolite, which is a fossilized microbial mat. Each one of these layers that you see in the rock represents the growth of that mat over time. Now if you look at that rock, you wouldn't know for sure that it was a potential biosignature. But when you couple the textures, as well as the chemical composition, the mineralogy, and the distribution of organic carbon, you can start to build a case that that rock could only have formed under the influence of life. Now this is exactly the type of thing that we do here on Earth to make a case for biosignatures in our own rock record. And for the very first time using our instruments, we can do that on the surface of Mars. So using that fine scale detail, coupled with the geologic context, we're going to do our best to identify, collect, and document the most compelling scientific cache of samples that we possibly can to address some big picture questions, fundamental questions, including you know, how did the, the surface and, and climate of Mars evolve over time? Uh, how, did, how do rocky planets form and differentiate? And of course, was life ever present on Mars? To accomplish this, we're going to use a scientific payload of seven instruments. Some of those instruments, like the Sherlock and Pixel instruments on the end of the, the, the rover's arm, which provide those mapping capabilities, as well as RIMFAX in the body of the rover that uses radar to study the subsurface of Mars are brand new. We've never sent them to Mars before. Other instruments like the SuperCam instrument and MassCam-Z up on the mast of the rover are updated versions of instruments that we flew on Curiosity. These instruments represent contributions from the US and our international uh, collaborators and are uniquely well suited for helping Mars 2020 accomplish its science objectives. As a part of that, we're preparing for future human exploration of Mars. And to do that, we're using instruments like the MOXIE instrument, which takes CO2 from the Martian atmosphere, converts it to oxygen, which is relevant for life support and potential creation of a fuel that could get those, those astronauts back home to Earth. We also have the META instrument, which is our weather, weather package that measures pressure, temperature, and humidity, which are pieces of information that astronauts would want to know if they wanted to work and live safely on Mars. So we're still eight months away from Perseverance landing on the surface of Mars, but our science team is busy at work prioritizing our, our most important science questions, 
trying to figure out where we would go with Perseverance to answer those questions, and thinking about what samples we want to put in our, on our sample cache. And we can't wait to get Perseverance to the surface of Mars. And so with that, I'll hand things over to our Deputy Project Manager, Matt Wallace, who'll tell us a little bit more about the engineering side of Perseverance and share with you some of the challenges that our team has had to overcome over these past few months. Thanks very much, Katie. Uh, yeah, uh, Perseverance is a big one metric ton vehicle, as the administrator said. It's a very capable system. At first glance, it looks a little bit like the Curiosity vehicle. Uh, and in fact, we have been able to leverage a lot of the investment that was made uh, to bring Curiosity to the surface. In particular, the entry, descent, and landing system uh, has some commonality. Uh, however, this vehicle is in fact uh, a new mission, a new vehicle with new capabilities. Uh, Katie talked about some of these enhanced instrumentation which were taken with us in technology uh, experiments. Um, I'll mention a couple of the engineering systems. Starting with the, uh, the wheels at the bottom of the vehicle, there are six wheels and they're, they've been uh, ruggedized so that they're more capable of dealing with the uh, the surface of Mars and pretty much anything that uh, Jezero Crater can, can throw at us. Also, we have a new powerful uh, computer that we've added. It's doing double duty, in fact. Uh, its first task is to uh, help us get safely down to the surface of the planet. Uh, it's taking imagery of the, of the uh, surface during the descent activity uh, and processing that imagery uh, and figuring out where we are uh, in Jezero, understanding re relative to the different hazards uh, in the uh, in the crater, and it will divert the spacecraft away from those hazards. Uh, now, Jezero is a very interesting scientific uh, target. It's got a lot of uh, relief, rocks, uh, cliffs, you know, hills, things like that, which are great for science, uh, but they are also challenging for landing a spacecraft on Mars. And so, this new system will keep us safe in going to this. Uh, exciting new science target, Jezero Crater. We also use this computer to help us process imagery on the surface uh, more uh, rapidly. And by doing that, we can look for hazards and we can avoid those hazards as we're traversing, uh, uh, doing our science mission. That allows us to drive at about twice the speed that Curiosity was able to drive, in fact. Um, in addition to the computer, we have uh, some new cameras. Now, now our, all our missions carry a lot of science and engineering cameras to begin with, uh, but we have something new this time. We've taken some ruggedized commercial cameras and we've uh, dispensed them around the spacecraft and those, uh, those cameras will be taking high definition video of the spacecraft during the entry, descent and landing activity. So we should be able to watch this big parachute inflate supersonically. We should be able to watch the rover uh, deploy and touch down on the surface. Uh, and this is going to be very exciting. It's the first time that we have ever been able to see a spacecraft land on another planet. And uh, we're looking forward to that imagery, ob obviously. You know, we take a lot of cameras with us to the surface of Mars, and we have, again, on previous missions, uh, a lot of eyes, but we've never taken ears. And so this time we're also taking a microphone, a couple microphones actually. And again, those microphones will be active during the entry, descent, and landing activity. We should be able to hear this system as it's going through the process of actually landing on Mars. And then when we get on Mars, we'll also be able to turn on the microphone, listen to the wheels turn over the surface uh, on, the, on the rocks, listen to our big rotary percussive drill out on the end of the robot arm, uh, sample those rocks, as well as, um, uh, as well as wind and other things. And so uh, those are all exciting new capabilities that we have on the vehicle. Now you don't get through a development of this complexity without a few problems, and uh, I'll, I'll just mention a couple. I'll start with a couple years ago, um, due to an anomaly on a parachute test program, uh, we had to take a second look at our own parachute and the design uh, that we had for that parachute. And we made the difficult decision to actually modify that parachute to strengthen the canopy, to give us more robustness during that supersonic uh, entry uh, activity. And that is not an easy thing to do, in part because um, you have to test this parachute. And testing parachutes uh, on Earth is difficult. You have to put it on a sounding rocket, which we did out of Wallops, 
facility down in Southern Virginia. You take them up to the upper atmosphere, and then you deploy these parachutes in the thin upper atmosphere to simulate the Martian environment. And what you're seeing here is a slow uh, motion uh, uh, video of one of those parachutes inflating. Uh, and in fact, these are difficult tests to do. Uh, this is the first supersonic planetary parachute test that we've done in about 40 years uh, for the agency. Uh, and, and the project was fortunate and able to pull off three pretty much perfect tests. Um, and, so, uh, and so that was one of the challenges we had. And Katie uh, mentioned and others mentioned the sampling system that we have on the vehicle. Our sampling system is, of course, composed of a lot of different mechanisms that we use to move the robot arm, to core the sample, and then to manipulate and seal the sample um, uh, after, we've, after we've collected it. Uh, and it's very difficult to, to build uh, mechanisms for a rover that has to operate flawlessly 100 million miles away. Uh, with no human intervention, and so building those gearboxes and those uh, and those motors uh, in an environment that that drops down to minus 200 degrees Fahrenheit pretty much uh, every night, uh, that's exposed to this very fine uh, Martian dust and has to deal with other adverse uh, environments is always a challenge. Our sampling system was particularly challenging in that we also had to keep it very, very clean. In fact, this is probably the cleanest system that we've ever launched uh, to, to Mars. Um, and the reason we needed to do that is that the science community, as you just heard, is looking for trace signatures from billions of years ago, trace chemical signatures. We don't want to confuse the search for those ancient signs of life with terrestrial contamination that we took with us to Mars and then, of course, brought back. And so that required a lot of effort to uh, understand how to get this system, both biologically and chemically, as clean as we need it, needed it. So those are some of the challenges. Uh, some of those kind of come along with the territory, but I will say a few months ago we were faced with something we really uh, never expected, as was the rest of our community and the rest of the country and the world. Uh, and, and that's the pandemic. Uh, it, it really uh, began to affect us in mid-March. We were at a critical time in the processing for the spacecraft. Uh, all the elements were down at Kennedy Space Center and we had to uh, fully assemble and do the final testing of the spacecraft. It had to be done right. You can't make a mistake at that point. And, uh, and, and of course the environment uh, made that a lot more difficult. So I think we have a short video here to talk a little bit about some of that final processing and uh, how we approach those, uh, those challenges relative to the COVID-19 situation. This new rover will search for signs of ancient life, test new technologies, and gather rock samples which may someday become the first pieces of the red planet ever returned to Earth for analysis. Today we are naming a spacecraft that will go to Mars, and the name is Perseverance. When Perseverance was first selected, you know, I, I wasn't sure about it, to be honest. When the pandemic struck, the future was certainly unknown. It was like walking into a blind, dark alley. You didn't know what was there, what was in front of you, what you were going to have to deal with. It's something that nobody expected. It's something nobody could plan for. Rather than your first priority being mission success and, and getting to the launch pad, your first priority immediately gets displaced and it's now the safety of the people. And it took a lot of work to put stuff together in order to keep momentum going, to keep people working safely, keep them healthy, and to keep the project uh, on schedule. We called the effort Mars 2020 Safe at Work, and the objective was uh, to keep the team as safe or safer than they would be if they were not working. You know, putting a spacecraft together that's going to Mars and not making a mistake, it's hard no matter what. Uh, trying to do it during the middle of a pandemic, it's it's a lot harder. There's no doubt that working in isolation, not virtual isolation, but in physical isolation from everyone else, is a challenge. 
hard for me. I have two young kids, um, and sometimes I, I'm not able to focus or listen probably as well as I would want to. A lot of our work was occurring in a clean room anyways, but that meant that even before we entered the clean room, we had to find ways of ensuring that uh, we were not putting ourselves or others at risk. We're really doing something that's transformative and trying to understand whether or not life evolved on another planet. That's the fundamental objective of this mission. We are explorers. Our job is to go into the unknown. And this is just another example of the unknown. How to make this job happen when you're doing it largely through a computer screen. Pretty much everybody that I've talked to that's associated with the mission has, has said the same thing, which is you could not have come up with a better name than Perseverance. You know, I'm, I'm a convert now. I, Perseverance is the right name for the rover. It's an amazing serendipity that we get to persevere through working on Perseverance. I think it now is, it's a really important symbol of humanity hopefully persevering through this great challenging time that we have right now. So you can see it was a challenge for us to overcome this, and we understand that, that uh, the Mars 2020 community uh, was not the only uh, group facing this. As I said, the community and, and the country and, and around the globe, uh, everybody had to deal with this. I asked the team a couple months ago if they would like to do something to um, kind of symbolize and mark uh, these, these challenges that we faced, uh, and they designed something that we called a COVID-19 perseverance plate. This is a plate that's now affixed to the port side of the rover. It has some a symbol of a, uh, uh, a globe representing uh, all of us that face this challenge together, the spacecraft leaving uh, the Earth on its way to Mars, and all of this supported uh, by the now familiar staff and servant of the uh, medical community. Uh, the community that was really on the front lines uh, keeping keeping us safe and you know they they really inspired us i think through this period and um and we hope that this plate and we hope that this mission uh in some in some small way can inspire can inspire them in return um you know this is uh this has been a team effort all along it's a big group of people um, that's required to do this type of uh, mission. And uh, it's not just the people on the team, but it is the, uh, the, the people that support us from the public. And, uh, and to mark that, we are carrying um, this plate that you see here. It has three microfiche, and those microfiche hold the 11 million names of the people that signed up uh, to take their name along with this spacecraft to Mars. Uh, we're very appreciative of, of that interest and the support that we have. And uh, that's part of what makes this job uh, so exciting. I mentioned the team, as I said, it's, it's a big team. And this is just the team here at uh, JPL uh, that were part, was part of this development. In fact, uh, the, the team spans every uh, center in the agency pretty much uh, as well as our international uh, contributors and our uh, tremendous industry partners that have been part of this. Um, everybody has worked together a lot of days, a lot of nights, <laughs> a lot of weekends and, and holidays to get us to the point where we're at. And to kind of tell you a little bit more about the integration and test activity that's been happening down at Kennedy Space Center uh, and, uh, and the final steps to get us to the pad. I'm going to hand it off to Luis Dominguez. Great. Thanks, Matt. Um, so the assembly test and launch operations team, also known as the ATLO team, started assembly of the spacecraft uh, back at JPL in January of 2018. The ATLO team is the team on the project that's entrusted with, uh, with putting together the final flight vehicle. And we take components from across JPL, the US, and the world and we start uh, populating that onto the spacecraft and testing them to make sure that everything works properly. Uh, we're talking about the radio, the flight computer, control boxes, antennas, lasers, all the different instruments that allow the spacecraft to, uh, to do its mission once it gets to Mars. Uh, when we initially shipped to KSC, the uh, spacecraft was, ac was actually shipped in pieces. So all the individual stages of the spacecraft were shipped independently, the crew stage, 
the descent stage, the rover stage, the back shell, and the heat shield. And when we arrived, we did a lot, uh, a lot of testing to make sure that uh, nothing was damaged in transportation and that everything was working appropriately. And then uh, we began to assemble the spacecraft for the last time. Uh, as the deputy electrical and integration and test lead for the team, my main focus is on integrating all the electrical and electromechanical components of the spacecraft while making sure that the personnel and the hardware is kept, are kept as safe as possible during that integration process. Um, we also, you know, it's a, it's a highly stressful, uh, highly demanding environment, um, but it's also extremely rewarding to, to see the spacecraft put together like that. At the moment, we're currently in the process of electrically integrating the harness that connects the spacecraft to the uh, last stage of the launch vehicle, uh, which was just installed last night, actually. And uh, as soon as I'm done here, I'm going to head into the, uh, into the uh, high bay to start checking that out. And uh, after that's complete, we will begin uh, encapsulation of the spacecraft. And uh, the encapsulation of the spacecraft is, is where we actually clamshell the spacecraft in between its two uh, payload fairings, which will protect it while it's uh, exiting Earth's orbit and on its way to Mars. Uh, as you can see, the spacecraft is a very small part of this, uh, of this launch vehicle, but um, it's the most important part, and uh, we're hoping uh, she gets there safe. Thanks, Luis. And I actually have a couple questions for you. What else is left for your team to complete on the Perseverance rover? So uh, once the uh, spacecraft is encapsulated, we will actually lift the spacecraft onto a transport vehicle. And then that transport vehicle will take it to the vertical integration fixture uh, facility, uh, where it'll get craned to the top of the rocket and mechanically integrated. And we'll do some final electrical closeouts um, before uh, we light the candle. That's great. And I also heard you started as an intern for the Curiosity rover. So what's it like to see your work on this next generation rover as it gets to the launch pad? It's been an amazing adventure here at NASA. Um, I started as an intern on the ATLO team, actually, for the Mars Science Laboratory project. And uh, it was interesting moving from more uh, smaller day-to-day, -day, week to week tasks um, when I was a student uh, to being a, a lead on this uh, very important mission and, and taking a much more strategic big picture view of integrating a spacecraft. Um, I can actually say I've touched and tested in some form every piece of hardware on this spacecraft. Um, and I truly appreciate the work NASA does to provide internships to students uh, around the country um, and thankful every day for having been given that opportunity. Uh, having grown up in South Central Los Angeles, I never thought I would be where I'm at today and it's an honor and a privilege to work with all the brilliant people on this team um, at JPL and uh, at NASA. I'm, I'm really looking forward to launch day. Thank you, Luis. Thank you for answering my questions. And hitching a ride on the Perseverance rover is the Mars helicopter, which now has a new name, Ingenuity. Ingenuity will attempt to be the first powered flight on another planet. Mars Helicopter Project Manager Mimi Ung has an update on this exciting new technology experiment. At this time, Mars Helicopter Ingenuity is fully integrated on the rover. The helicopter is stowed under the belly pin of the rover and has been checked out to be fully operational in the configuration that is going to be launched and operated in space. Our team is now preparing for operation after launch, updating our simulations and rehearsing for the scenarios that we're going to encounter. Uh, starting with monitoring the health of the vehicle through the cruise to Mars, when the rover deploys the helicopter, and commissioning of the helicopter, all the way to our very first rotorcraft flight attempt at Mars. Seeing our helicopter get launched is the start of everything our team has worked for, and after it lands, it's going to be extraordinary. After all of us working really hard for over six years, it's going to be outstanding to get to attempt the very first rotorcraft flight test at Mars. And in fact, first time on any other planet outside of our own Earth. Both Perseverance and Ingenuity are riding on the same rocket to Mars. Right now, NASA Launch Director Omar Bias joins us with an update. Hello there. Hello from Florida. So um, we're 34 days from launch. And the things that are going on uh, have been touched on here. 
Um, the spacecraft will go, undergo encapsulation, as Luis says, into the clamshell or the fairing halves uh, in the coming weeks. The launch vehicle, if um, they could roll the uh, tape. Um, this is actually the uh, rover coming in. And this is misleading because um, that rover, that's one piece of it. There was 16 tractor trailers that came in with other equipment. There was another flight for other pieces. So uh, it just, it did not just fit in that box. There's a lot more that went into this uh, mission and the assembly started in January back here. This is actually the uh, Atlas booster being offloaded from uh, the Antonov airplane that brings it in from Decatur, Alabama, uh, where the uh, booster is built. Um, the booster um, provides the first four minutes and 20 seconds of power for the flight before the uh, Centaur, the, the upper stage, um, it takes over and, uh, and puts us into its final uh, escape orbit from the um, Earth to Mars. Um, along with the, um, the uh, first stage booster um, are four solid rocket motors, which you see being assembled here. Those will burn for approximately a minute and 50 seconds, providing the initial boost to get that complete stack of the first stage and the upper stage, Curiosity, the payload fairing to its uh, C3 velocity, the escape velocity of 14.4 kilometers square, seconds square, uh, for those that need preciseness. Um, that'll get us on its way. Um, we're looking forward to uh, July 20th uh, for that uh, 9.15 time to get them going and so that the uh, booster can uh, do its descent and landing into uh, Mars in February. Uh, from behalf of the uh, Launch Services Program here at KSC, we look forward to it. We're looking forward to uh, fueling the uh, vehicle this coming Monday as part of our wet dress rehearsal. Um, and uh, after that, we will be um, putting that encapsulated assembly of the uh, spacecraft and the fairing on top of the uh, booster and uh, doing the final preparations for installation of the uh, power source uh, that'll power the rover uh, for years to come. So uh, from behalf of NASA and the Launch Services Program, it's a pleasure um, to do this launch and uh, 34 days from now, um, we'll have some happy faces here. Thanks for the update, Omar. We're looking forward to the happy faces. Now we are ready to take media questions. Remember to press star one to get put in the queue and please direct your questions to one of the panelists. We're also gonna take questions through the Ask NASA hashtag, but first on the phone line is Bill Harwood from CBS News. Oh, thank you very much. And I appreciate this guys for taking the time to chat with us. Um, Two very quick questions. One is uh, just to have an update, maybe for Lori. What's the what? What is the total cost of this mission, or what number should we be using? And and maybe for Omar, how much? Uh, and and for Matt Wallace, how much reserve is left in the schedule to handle anything that goes out of the ordinary? Are you right down to the wire, or have you got some time to handle uh, unexpected issues? Thanks. Great. So thanks for the question. Um, so I can tell you that the cost for the development uh, of the Perseverance rover all the way up through launch is about $2.4 billion. And then there's another $300 million uh, that we'll spend to, to operate Perseverance uh, once it's after its launch and it's on its way and then once it lands and to do all of the surface science uh, once it gets to Mars. I'll toss it back over to Omar and to uh, Matt. Yeah, I'll just say... Okay. Uh, and as Relative to the spacecraft, um, the, the, uh, the, the key margin that we have is in the launch window itself. Um, we're, we're targeting the first launch, launch day as uh, July 20th, as Omar said. But the window, in fact, uh, uh, lasts until uh, uh, August 11th. And, so, and, and even during those single days, we have multiple uh, opportunities to recycle if there's some issues. And so we think we have some robustness there. We have good robustness there in the launch window. 
Uh, relative to the launch uh, vehicle processing, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Omar. And uh, yeah, Bill, relative to schedule, we are a green light schedule from here on out. In other words, any any major perturbation could affect the launch date. But as Matt said, we got plenty of, of window or runway ahead of us, and uh, we're not worried about it. I'm, I'm sure, you know, Florida weather as it is, uh, you know, it's been perfect the last couple of days, but we'll probably run into some not so perfect days that could set us back. And the team is flexible enough um, to, to be able to handle uh, a three week window, um, I would say. Um, and, and we have analyzed that to the 11th of August. Um, and if need be, and the analysis uh, provides us additional margin, we might even get out to the 15th of August. So. Uh, no concerns from our part. Great. And now the next question is for Maria Corin from The Atlantic. Hi, everyone. Uh, this question is for whoever would like to take it. Um, there are some scientists and other space fans out there who think that NASA has given a lot of attention to robotic missions to Mars over the years, and they want to see spacecraft visit other spots in the solar system, especially moons where there might be evidence of life right now rather than ancient signs. So I'm wondering what you would say to those people who believe that Mars is a little bit overstudied and that we should be focusing elsewhere in the solar system on the search for life. I'll be happy to take Sorry, that, that question, like Maria. Thank question. you. Um, <laughs> I'll take it. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, for one, am a fan of our entire solar system. I love every every destination that we have. There's incredible science across, as you know, the entire solar system. Mars has been uh, a really fantastic place to uh, to really explore in depth. And so our Mars Exploration Program has really done an amazing job at Mars, and we, we, there's still a lot of work to be done there. But I absolutely agree with you that there are other places in the solar system that might actually be uh, maybe even better places to be looking for actual extant life that might be present today. And of course, the moons of, uh, of Jupiter and Saturn, uh, you know, for Europa or Enceladus or maybe even Titan are places where we feel like there may actually be environments that could be conducive to having life today. For example, on Europa and Enceladus that are covered in ice, certainly there is probably low probability of life on the surface, but beneath that ice, we believe there are these deep oceans that may have uh, thermal uh, sources at the at the base of those that are driven by geologic processes that recycle the oceans and recycle the nutrients within those waters and could actually be sites where we think you have all the ingredients necessary for life. And so we are looking for uh, great ideas to send other missions. We've got Europa Clipper that's going to be uh, going to Europa uh, to uh, map the surface. It's a, an orbiting mission that'll orbit Jupiter and make several passes uh, of Europa. Uh, that'll launch later in this decade. And now we're also developing the mission uh, Dragonfly, uh, which will launch uh, in 2026 to go to, uh, to Titan. Uh, and to explore the environments there on the surface. That's actually the next uh, rotorcraft that will fly in a planetary atmosphere is an octocopter that will land on the surface of Titan. So those are also excellent destinations and we're very interested in them and pursuing a variety of different ways to get there. Thanks, Lori. And up next on the phone lines is Marsha Dunn with AP. Yes, hello, thank you. Um, I have some questions about the return samples. The animation almost makes it look like the cylinders with samples are just sort of dropped on the surface of Mars, um, sort of scattered. How, how are you going to um, leave these samples for pickup? Do they have beacons in case there's a, a dust storm of some sort? And also, uh, maybe for Dr. Glaze, um, why 10 years to get the samples back? I, I would think, I know you want them as soon as possible, and waiting a decade just seems like a long time. So um, if you could answer that, that'd be swell. Thanks. Uh, so I, I was can... going to suggest that perhaps Katie take the first part, or, or Matt. Yeah, I can start off and Katie can, can jump in here. Just just to understand how the, the samples are uh, collected and, and then left on the surface, we do collect them as individual tubes. 
and we have the ability to drop those tubes either in ones and twos or in, in groups. Our, our current intent is, a, is to drop them in, in a grouping uh, so that the fetch rover, which you saw in the animation, would not have to go to many locations to actually pick those tubes up. Uh, and so we have complete flexibility, but that, that would be the, uh, the intent. As far as the dust storms go, uh, we, know how, we know how the sand and the dust uh, uh, moves on Mars, and we know what locations to select to make sure these, these uh, are not affected by, uh, by those types of uh, issues. Uh, and so we don't think there's going to be any issue with respect to uh, covering up the tubes over the period of time that we're talking about or finding the tubes on the surface. Uh, and Katie can say a word or two maybe about the, the sort of science strategy associated with that. Yeah, that's something that we are still very much thinking about and will be guided by our exploration on the surface as we, you know, decide where and how to sample um, and, and where we'd like to leave that sample cache. You know, I think it's important to, to, to think about what samples go in what cache and where uh, as, as the, the fetch rover capabilities develop and, and Mars sample return architecture develops as well. So we'll be thinking about that and that'll probably be an active iterative conversation that we have with the Mars 2020 project as well as the Mars sample return architecture as it, as it develops. Great. Yeah, so I'll, I'll now try to take the next part of that question, which is, you know, why does it take so long to actually get the samples back? And you're absolutely right. We definitely want to try and get those samples back here. They're very precious. We want to uh, to get them back here so that we can start the analysis and, and learn from, from the samples. But this is a really complex uh, concept to try and bring those samples back and in fact we've always known from the very beginning that this was not going to be a simple a simple mission where we simply fly to Mars collect the samples and bring them back we've always known it was going to require multiple steps and multiple uh, launches in order to actually get the the samples back not only because of the time required but the cost as well so we need to pace that out we're really in a great position right now where we have developed a fantastic partnership with European Space Agency which actually actually allows us to get those samples back a little bit earlier than had originally been planned if we were trying to do it all on our own. By collaborating with ESA, it allows us to have two launchers from Earth, a European launch and a NASA launch, that will send the Mars sample return mission out to Mars, collect the samples and bring them back, like the animation that you saw, allows us to do that in a shorter time period. Right now we're working on and developing uh, the plans for that Mars sample return mission. We're planning towards a launch around 2026, which would then bring those samples back in 2031. Uh, it takes a little time to get out there. It takes time to pick up the samples on the surface. Then it takes time to actually get out of orbit at Mars and bring them back. So it's, it's a long and involved process, but it's one we're absolutely dedicated to and we're gonna make it happen. Great, that was some great teamwork getting that question answered, thank you. And on the line now we have Keith Cohen with NASA Watch. Hi, I have a question for Jim Bridenstine. It's a, it's a branding question. Uh, you just brought back the worm logo. So uh, Bobby Brown was recently on 60 Minutes, and he referred to this mission as NASA's first astrobiology mission. Now, of course, the Vikings were, but I'll, I'll let Bobby add that. Uh, but NASA has a program that's been going on for 20 years, and it's called Astrobiology. Yet if you go to the website for this mission, unless you know where the one page is where it mentions astrobiology, there's no links, no nothing. You go to the Astrobiology page, you, they don't even know this, uh, this thing is happening today. They don't even mention the rover. And so I'm kind of wondering, you know, there's sort of, going to be four rovers on Mars soon all doing astrobiology, and it's going to be a big deal. So maybe you could explain a little bit on the branding and the marketing here, why NASA can't get their act together, and maybe, you know, hoping to hear that you're going to get this all figured out by the time the thing lands. <laughs> no, that's – Keith, that's a great, a great question and a great point. Um, I'll tell you, astrobiology is, is really something that um, – it depends how you define it, whether or not this is the first mission or not. If you look at what we did – with spirit and opportunity, we made discoveries. We discovered that on the northern hemisphere of Mars, it was two thirds covered with water. Um, that indicates that it had a very thick atmosphere, that it had maybe even a strong magnetosphere, which would indicate that Mars at one time had a molten core. When we think about having a thick atmosphere and liquid water on the surface in a magnetosphere, all of that indicates that Mars was maybe at one time habitable. In other words, there, it could have supported life. So you could argue that even when we were doing spirit and opportunity, 
that those missions were astrobiology missions. And of course, with curiosity and now perseverance, um, we're building on that base of knowledge. And so all of that is so important. We are, in fact, trying to find signatures of life. Um, and of course, we're, we're interested in finding life itself. Now, um, that's not what this mission specifically is all about, but I can tell you uh, in the last couple of years, you know, NASA has made some significant discoveries, complex organic compounds on the surface of Mars, methane cycles that match the seasons of Mars, um, liquid water 12 kilometers under the surface of Mars. Um, so there's, there's so many things that are um, kind of building up here to say that, look, the probability of finding life on another world is going up. We're not saying it's there. I don't know that it's there. Nobody else knows either. Uh, but that's really what astrobiology is all about. And Mars really gives us the best opportunity, I think, in the short term to make a significant discovery that will forever change how we think of ourselves and forever change um, how we think of space exploration in general. Look, if we can find life on another world, it, it, I think people are going to be so excited about the discovery and what comes next um, that, that we're gonna be doing missions throughout the solar system. I know that the question earlier about why are we going to Mars and not these other places? Certainly we wanna go to all those places and we have plans to go to all those places. Um, but, but it's also true that, um, that you know, the highest probability of, of maybe finding life at this point is gonna, is gonna be Mars. There are, there are people out there who would say um, that Europa or Enceladus uh, provide biologically a higher probability um, but technologically, that's, that's going to take some more time. And of course, working on that. JPL, I want to give a, a lot of kudos, a lot of compliments to JPL, which is, you know, a partner with NASA. It's, we, we call it one of NASA's centers. Of course, it's affiliated with Caltech. Um, but what an amazing job by that team. And of course, they're building the, the plans and, and, and the hardware that's going to help us get to Europa, that moon of Jupiter, where, where we believe there's, um, the the um, the ingredients that could potentially have life. Um, so there's a lot of exciting things in the field of astrobiology. And, you know, 15 years ago, even 10 years ago, um, if you would have said these things, people would have looked at you like you're crazy. And now it's, it's starting to become more and more real. So it's a, it's a great question. It's a great point. And it's, it's something NASA thinks about all the time. Great. Thanks, Jim. And we've been getting some questions coming in through the Ask NASA hashtag. I'm going to read one of them now. Aaron on Twitter is asking, apart from entry, descent, and landing, what is the most challenging part of the mission? Well, I can uh, I can uh, answer try to answer that question. Uh, there's a lot to choose from. Uh, these these missions are very very difficult. You know, we talked about the, the challenge just in the last few months. Um, dealing with the pandemic, obviously, but I think from a basic mission perspective, the most difficult part uh, has has been uh, building and testing the the sampling system uh, that we referred to. As I said before, it's composed of a lot of different uh, mechanisms. Uh, these are uh, systems that have to operate at a very high level of reliability. Um, they have to uh, operate autonomously. Uh, there's a lot of control and autonomy in our software systems um, that go along with them. Uh, they require extensive uh, test facilities uh, so that we can simulate the Martian environment and, and the right set of rocks and targets. Uh, and then, of course, um, you know, on this mission in particular, uh, because of the, the search for, for those uh, those very faint biosignatures, which Katie and other people talked about, um, we had to keep them uh, essentially sterile from a biological perspective and exceptionally clean, especially organically clean, which are the signatures, the chemical signatures we're most interested in. So uh, that's a difficult thing to do uh, when the rest of your spacecraft um, is, uh, is, is uh, really uh, designed and inherited from the systems that we have to use in the aerospace industry and in civil space. Uh, so we had to isolate a lot of the <clears throat> key critical components uh, from, from the other parts of the spacecraft from a contamination perspective. And that was, I think, the biggest challenge for, for this mission. You know, once we get on the surface of Mars, we have 
a responsibility to put together a cache of samples that is compelling enough and worthy enough to return to Earth and you know, interesting enough that it will propel and drive future generations of, of Mars science and, and, and planetary science. And we take that responsibility very seriously and we know that we have a tough job to do on the surface to put that sample cache together. And so I think that's going to be a challenge that we have uh, to put together diverse samples, those that have potential biosignatures, and enough samples that we cover, cover the ground um, to get that job done. So we take that very seriously and I think that's going to be a big challenge for our, our, our team once we get on Mars. Thanks, Katie. And Matt, you kind of touched on this. Nas on Twitter is asking, is there any level of autonomy included on this Mars rover? There's a lot of autonomy. Um, again, just starting with the entry, descent, and landing activity, you know, uh, one-way light time to Mars is about 10 minutes. And from the time we hit the outer atmosphere of Mars to the time uh, we're safely on the ground, it's about seven minutes. Uh, we refer to it as the seven minutes of terror. There is absolutely no interaction with the spacecraft during that period of time. It has to do that entire process uh, itself. It has to understand uh, you know, where it is from a navigation perspective. It has to know when to jettison the crew stage and deploy the parachute. It has to understand um, where it is in Jezero. I talked about this terrain relative navigation system this is really, again, another level of autonomy that we're laying on top of our historical uh, autonomy on these missions. And this is a feed-forward capability that these future human missions, as well as the sample return mission, which Lori talked about, will we'll need and will want to use. Uh, trying to understand where those hazards are and divert away from them, all of that requires uh, the spacecraft to understand, to, to do those things on its own. And that's before we even get to the surface. You know, once we're on the surface, we really are only able to command the vehicle once a day. Uh, and so it, it'll sleep and conserve power overnight. It'll wake up in the morning. We'll send a sequence of commands, give it its daily set of activities to do. Uh, and then it has to carry them out pretty much by itself. You know, it has, to, it has to make the decisions on how to drive to the target and how to do a lot of that sampling work that we talked about, as well as keeping it safe under keeping itself safe under adverse anomalous conditions. And so there's a tremendous amount of autonomy in the vehicles. And it's one of the things that makes the system so complex. Thanks, Matt. I'm gonna head back to the phone lines now. We have Gina Sunsuri from ABC. Uh, my question's been asked and answered, thank you. Great, thanks, Gina. All right, we'll go next to Mike Wall from space.com. Thank you all for doing this. Um, this one's probably for actually Matt, and it's, it's just about the helicopter. And I, but like, I'd just like a few details maybe about what you would consider mission success for the helicopter. Like, how many flights do you hope to make? How far will those flights be? And also, is there a possibility that we'll get kind of perseverance eye views of the helicopter going up and, and exploring Mars skies? Because that would be pretty fantastic if you can pull that off. Thank you. Sure, I'll, I'll say a few words about the helicopter and that uh, this, this is really uh, something that's cutting edge. You know, this is, uh, as the administrator said, something that's never been attempted before. And flying in Martian atmospheric conditions, um, which, you know, the, the atmosphere on Mars is only 1% the density that we have here on the Earth, and trying to control a system like this under those, um, those conditions is, is not easy. Uh, in flight, and then you have to land it safely in an unknown terrain. You know, these are all big challenges, and that's why this is a, this is a technology demonstration payload. This is something that, uh, you know, that we're taking with us so that we can learn how to do this for future missions. Um, and so, uh, you know, that, that's, really, that's really the objective, is, is to get, get the helicopter just to be able to accommodate it on the vehicle was a big step. Getting it to Mars, getting it safely off the vehicle, uh, we're going to learn a lot. And really, just the very first flight um, where this helicopter spins its rotors and, and lifts up off the ground, uh, it's going to be both historic and, and we're going to learn a lot. Uh, and so we are not, uh, you know, we, we are not looking for an extensive and ambitious a return from this technology, we're looking to learn those first few things that we need to learn with the technology. 
Um, we should be able to image the helicopter while it's flying uh, from, from the rover. Uh, we're going to have a safe standoff distance, you know, 50 to 100 meters or so. Uh, but we have pretty powerful cameras that we should be able to zoom in, and, and uh, we're hoping to be able to catch, uh, catch, that, uh, catch that flight. Whether or not the helicopter will actually see the vehicle, the Perseverance rover, uh, will depend a little bit on orientation and, and how high it goes and those sorts of things. Great, thanks Matt. And now on the line we have Lauren Gersh from The Verge. Hi, thank you so much for taking my question. I think this is for Katie possibly. Seeing as how Perseverance is all about deciding whether or not Mars has had past life, I'm curious to know what you are considering a biosignature and how you will make the distinction whether or not you have actually found evidence of past life on Mars. Thanks. Yes, thank you. That's a great question, and it's one that we think a lot about on the science team. You know, I think our, our bar, bar is, is high for the identification of a sign of life on another planet, as it should be, um, because we don't want to make that discovery uh, lightly. Um, but at the same time, with, with perseverance and its goal of seeking signs of ancient life, I think we also have to, to open our minds to the, the possibilities of what life could look like on another planet and, and looking for, you know, examples of, you know, of something that is similar to what we, we see in, in biosignatures on our own Earth record. And so I think what we're looking for are, are really the patterns and textures where we have a hard time explaining how that could have formed without the influence of life. And I think every time we see something on the surface of Mars that, that kind of gets us asking those questions, we go through the list of, of possibilities, you know, could it have formed in an abiotic way? And I think if we get to the point where we are really struggling to, to explain a phenomenon or something that we see uh, with abiotic processes, I think that's when we start to say, you know, I think this could be a potential biosignature. But I think it's also important to, to realize that very likely uh, we'll have to return those samples to Earth to make that definitive conclusion about whether these samples contain life in them. So I think on for the Perseverance side, we see it as our, our job to identify potential biosignatures, things that are worthy of additional study here on Earth with a full arsenal of analytical capabilities that we have here in our own laboratories. And I think that's how we're going to approach that, that question on the surface of Mars. Great. And up next, we have Antonia Jaramillo with Florida Today. Hi, thanks for taking my question. I was just wondering, as cases of coronavirus in Florida continue to rise, will NASA be asking the public again to watch this launch from home? And if so, will it also provide a virtual experience show like it did for Demo 2? Thanks. So for this particular mission, uh, we're, we're asking people to follow uh, the, the guidelines of the, the governor of Florida. Uh, we want everybody to practice social distancing. And um, and if if, uh, if you're within six feet, make sure you're wearing a mask, those kind of things. Um, but we're, you know, we, we uh, we're not telling people not to not to visit for this launch. We're not saying that. Um, what we do have to make sure we do is we protect the workforce at the Kennedy Space Center because we have a lot of work ahead of us, especially this summer. Um, we've got the entry, descent, and landing of the Crew Dragon that, that took our astronauts to the International Space Station. Um, we have um, just a lot of other activities uh, we have to make sure. So we're not going to open up the Kennedy Space Center, um, but certainly uh, people are people are going to travel. We ask people not to travel for for DM2. Uh, which was, of course, the, the launch of the Falcon 9 rocket with the Crew Dragon and um, Doug Hurley and Bob Benkin in the, in the capsule. Um, and <laughs> it, it appears they didn't listen to us. <laughs> so um, we're asking people to follow um, all of the necessary guidelines to, to keep themselves safe, and we're trusting them. Thanks, Jim. Up next is Dave Mosier with Business Insider. Uh, thank you for taking my question and good luck with the launch. Um, Matt, you mentioned the EDL video cameras. I'd like to know more about those. Uh, what resolution will they film in? When might we expect that seven minutes of terror footage to get back to Earth? And uh, will you have any use for them after landing? And then um, I also understand that this is a discretionary payload. Um, did these cameras sort of beat out any other ideas that the team had? Thank you. Uh, yeah, those are all good questions. I'll try to answer them in, in some sort of order. But um, uh, uh, just to, to start with your last uh, question, uh, these were not uh, 
Um, these were not in competition with any other payload on the, on the spacecraft. Our payloads were selected uh, via the normal process and, um, and as we got further down the road and got more mature, um, we realized we, you know, that we had an opportunity, we had some uh, residual, uh, some residual capability to, to, to install these. They take very, very little uh, mass and, and volume. I don't have the numbers exactly, but um, they're, they're essentially uh, you know, uh, unnoticeable <laughs> at the spacecraft level as far as resource requirements go. Uh, and that's because um, we didn't build something new. We didn't build something uh, you know, uh, that was uh, particularly sophisticated. We were able to go out and use uh, commercial uh, off-the-shelf uh, available uh, products. And um, and so uh, uh, and so that that made it a lot easier to to uh, go s both develop them uh, quickly at low cost and and to uh, accommodate them. Uh, resolution wise, um, I'll have to check. I believe there are 10 megapixel uh, cameras. Um, uh, frame rates as high as uh, 40, I think frames per per second. Um, but uh, um, we can get the exact uh, we can get the exact numbers. They produce a lot of data. Um, the data is not going to come back in real time during entry, descent, and landing. Uh, we have very limited uh, telemetry during that period, and so we'll bring that that imagery back over the first uh, couple weeks on the surface. Thanks, Matt. Up next is Paul Brinkman with UPI. Uh, yes. Hello. Thanks for doing this. Um, obviously, the Mars rovers have surprised in the past uh, in terms of how long uh, they've stayed operational. Um, I'm wondering, you know, what is the outside uh, length of time that, that uh, both uh, Perseverance and uh, Ingenuity could be operational? And um, also regarding the, uh, the helicopter, um, to what extent have, have, do you know, like, how many flights there might be for that? Thanks. Uh, so I can uh, I can uh, respond to the uh, longevity question. Um, we we have a primary mission defined for the vehicle of one Mars year, which is is roughly uh, you know two, two Earth years, and that's similar to the design requirement for uh, for Curiosity. Um, as you know, Curiosity is is uh, is still operating on the surface here about eight years or so since we, we landed. Um, th the good news about these systems is that although they're, they have to operate in a harsh environment, that environment is relatively uh, repeatable and stable. And so once you get past um, those, those initial uh, issues, those infant mortality issues, um, it's not unusual for our spacecraft uh, to continue on for uh, uh, well beyond their design, design lifetime. Uh, Voyager 1 and 2 are the best examples I can think of, you know. Um, but but uh, there's no guarantee. And so we try to operate the system under the assumption that, um, you know, that we'll only have so much time to, uh, to get the work done and, uh, uh, and build it robustly and, and hope that we get more time. Great. Uh, does anyone want to take on the ingenuity question? On uh, ingenuity, we have um, th three f uh, flights uh, designed for, for the surface, I think, uh, you know, kind of nominally. Uh, however, as I said, um, we're, uh, we're going to take them one flight at a time. So. And then up next is Tony Rice with WRAL. Uh, thanks for taking my question. Uh, so this is from Matt Wallace. Uh, one of the few disappointments from the Curiosity entry descent and landing was the damage that occurred to the wind sensor on the REMS, REMS instrument. Have there been any changes in the, the EDL procedure or in the MEDA instrument itself to prevent something similar from happening again, based on what you learned nearly eight years ago? Yeah, one of, one of the things we learned with our sky crane system is that we have the ability to kick up some debris from the engines on the descent stage. And, um, and we have taken, uh, we had ma have made some changes uh, on this project to protect things that are sensitive to that or potentially sensitive to that. Optics, wind sensors are good examples. Uh, we have a debris shield, for instance, around the helicopter on the bottom of the vehicle. 
so the answer is yes. We've we've tried to adjust for uh, for that environment. Thanks again, Matt. We have a lot of people on the lines right now. Up next is Lee Holtz with the Wall Street Journal. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for taking a question. Uh, for the administrator, if I may, NASA is not alone in voyaging to Mars this summer. China expects to launch its first uh, Mars lander, I guess. Uh, the United Arab Emirates is launching its first interplanetary mission, Destination Mars. Uh, the European Space Agency and Russia are putting their lander together for 2022 now, I guess. And, of course, SpaceX keeps talking about starting the cash supplies for future colonists. I mean, this is very busy. I wonder if you'd reflect for us on the changing nature of interplanetary exploration in this uh, age of internationalization. What are the operational and diplomatic uh, effects from your vantage? Thank you. Well, that's a, another very important question. The first thing that we're going to need is additional communication throughput. Uh, that's the number one thing that, that we're going to need. And um, we're, we're already um, at the limits of, of, of our communication capabilities for, for deep space. So we're going to need to really plus up the architecture for that. But to your point, a lot of these countries that do these activities, they they, um, they want to use the deep space network that, uh, that NASA has established, and um, we're, we're very um, willing uh, to support uh, in that effort. Um, this is about science and discovery, exploration, and, um, and I think when people see countries doing these stunning things on other worlds, um, it inspires all of us. And so uh, certainly we are, we are supportive of, of these activities. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to get humans to Mars. That's, that's the objective. Um, and these robotic precursor missions, I think, kind of uh, open the eyes of, of the American people and people all around the world as to what the possibilities are. And it helps inspire that, that next generation. In fact, maybe even our generation where we see uh, humans uh, living and working on, on the surface of Mars. Um, so there's, there's, um, there's a lot that goes into this. You know, I'm very excited about the United Arab Emirates and their, their HOPE mission. Um, we have done a lot uh, to support them, and um, they want to be big supporters of ours in the Artemis program. Um, and, of course, they're very involved in, uh, you know, they're going to be launching in a few short years their own uh, rover to the surface of the moon. So uh, a lot of countries are stepping up in a big way Countries that um, historically have not been, uh, you know, ex exploration countries are stepping up and not just not just uh, talking about it, but backing it up with budgets. And so all of this is going to be very helpful for us as we move forward. Uh, NASA is an is a, is an institution that is a tool of diplomacy, and there is no better diplomacy than exploring our own solar system together and eventually uh, the the rest of our galaxy and universe. Great. Thanks, Jim. And now we have Chris and Carlo with KFI News. Yeah, thanks, guys, for taking my question. Um, just going back to COVID here real quick, you, some specific challenges you guys obviously faced in working remotely. NASA and JPL are a bit famous for adapting and building out new systems for those adaptations. And I'm just curious about what adaptations to workflow may be carried forward in the future. What lessons did you learn during the uh, shutdown? I'll, I'll start. There's there's so many different things. Um, you know, as right now, most of NASA is working remotely. Um, NASA has been for a long time very forward leaning on uh, teleworking. And so it was really easy for us to actually go to, uh, you know, a profile where most of us are, are working remotely. So that that really was not uh, terribly problematic. At the same time, we, we still have to build hardware. And our contractors still have to build hardware, so we have to make sure that you know we're 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 doing what we can for social distancing, um, you know, changing shifts so that instead of having you know 12 people working on a vehicle at the same time, we could divide it up, um, and instead have eight-hour shifts where you've got you know three shifts of four people working on a vehicle, uh, and of course making sure everybody has their personal protective equipment and those kind of things. Um, you know, as we move forward, as we as we start going, you know, we went all the way to stage four at a lot of our centers, which meant 
basically nobody can come to work because um, you look at some of our centers, there were some, some, some outbreaks of coronavirus in the regions where those centers are. Um, but now we're getting to a point where we can go to stage three, where we have mission critical, not mission essential, which is what Mars 2020 is, but mission critical functions, which um, are still very important missions that we need to start getting back underway. Um, and, and eventually we want to get back to stage two and eventually back to normal working, a normal working environment. But I think one of the things that we've taken away is how much work you can actually do when you're still at home. Um, and and there, so there, there's different types of work that you're able to do from home. And I'll tell you, when I'm at home, I'm doing a lot more outreach than I've ever been able to do before because everybody is either a phone call or a teleconference away. Um, we're not having to organize schedules to get everybody's schedules to perfectly match and, and travel and everything else. So there's there's certain areas where you're more productive and other areas where you're less productive. Um, and I think when we get back to a more normalized work environment, we're going to have to take you know, the lessons learned um, and, and apply them. And I know I know JPL um, has been thinking about these things as well. Um, so I, I don't know if anybody else has anything to add. Yeah, I mean, we're, I'll just uh, agree with the administrator completely. You know, we're carrying these lessons forward. Uh, we're starting to look as well into the, at least relative, just relative to 2020, we're, we're pulling the, the lessons learned that we've uh, acquired over the last several months into our operations. We're thinking about what it means with respect to critical activities like entry, descent, and landing. Um, and and we're, we're getting a lot better at, at uh, uh, every day, really, I think, at operating remotely uh, and understanding how to safely bring people in to get the work done, uh, uh, as as was discussed. Thank you. And next on the line is Jennifer Lerman with Popular Mechanics. Hi. Um, thank you so much for taking uh, these questions. Um, a quick question for uh, maybe either Matt or Katie. Um, what do you hope to learn by recording sound during the mission? And then, Katie, actually, another very quick question. Um, you mentioned that you had you were a little bit iffy about the name Perseverance. Was there another name that you also uh, favored, perhaps? Um, thank you again. Yeah, maybe I'll maybe I'll start off and to your first question, you know, what we hope to use the microphones for, you know, I think we're really excited to hear the sounds of Mars and and the sounds of the rover interacting with its environment, you know, we'll hear the wheels whir and the gears turning um, and we have a microphone on the SuperCam instrument. So when we uh, basically zap the rocks with the SuperCam laser, we'll hear that zip sound um, and that may tell us some something about the properties of the rocks themselves. So there may be some science to glean from that as well. Um, so we're excited to, to, to use our, the rover's ears to do that. Um, in terms of the, the rover names, you know, I there were nine candidates there and I think everybody had their favorite. Um, I don't know that I had, I had a particular favorite there. Um, but you know, in the end, uh, the rover name just, it, when the rover name is selected, uh, it just really becomes part of the rover. And once that name is selected, you can't separate the rover from its name. And so, you know, I think those of us who've worked on some previous rover missions, it just happens. And, and once the name is selected, it just becomes. And so I think that's very much what's happened uh, with Perseverance for me personally. And I think I know that that's true for everyone else too. So it is Perseverance and we're excited that it is. <laughs> Great, thank you. And up next is Leo Enright with Irish Television. Uh, thanks, Raquel. I think this is probably for Katie, who talked about the complexity of uh, collecting samples on the surface. Uh, the, the actor Matt Damon famously science the you-know-what out of Mars, uh, and we can certainly say that the Curiosity rover has done that uh, at Gale Crater. But it does seem like uh, the traverse there has been far, far slower uh, than most people would have expected, for, for very good reasons. Uh, Yellowknife alone uh, would delay you for months. Um, but I'm just wondering, will there be different time pressures uh, on this mission uh, at each sample site just to get the sample and move on to the next to collect enough for the return cash? Will it be more of a shoot and scoot mission? 
Yeah, so that, that's a great question and, and one that we are thinking a lot about um, as we, we come up with notional scenarios for the mission and what our sample cache might look like. One thing that we know about that sample cache is that we wanted to have diversity uh, and we wanted to cover the interval of time that we think the rocks in Jezero represent and that does require us covering substantial ground uh, to, to put a, a cache together like that. Um, but I think we have a couple of advantages on our side, particularly in comparison to uh, Curiosity and Gale Crater. Part of the reason we picked Jezero Crater as a landing site was because it had such a well understood environment that we could see and understand from orbital images alone. And so in, in Curiosity, Curiosity's case in Gale Crater, uh, you know, you have a, a five kilometer thick mound and, and uncertainty of what that mound actually represents geologically. So we've had to spend a lot of time with that mission uh, doing the, the science to understand what rocks we're even looking at. With Jezero, we know already that we have a delta. We know that we had a lake in Jezero Crater, and we know that this crater is perched on the, the, the rim of a giant impact basin. Uh, so we expect things like impact megabreccia, sampling some of that ancient Noachian crust on Mars. So I think the fact that we have such a good understanding of this landing site already uh, really helps us plan and plot out the course of, of our sampling exploration. So I think that really helps us. And so I think we will feel some pressure to, to cover that ground simply because we want to put together the best cache of samples that we can. But, but we have some advantages, I think, over some previous missions in terms of how well we understand our landing site already. Great. Uh, one more question from Aklo Ja from The Economist. Hi there. Um, can you hear me? Um, I've got a, a really quick question for the scientists. Um, probably Dr. Morgan. Um, uh, you, uh, and then another one as well. But the first one, you, you talk about how um, this mission is the very latest in to sort of the long quest to try and answer the question of whether there was life at one point on Mars. Um, I just wondered if you could describe just briefly, um, what is it about perseverance that what will it be able to do that previous missions possibly haven't to get us closer to answering that question? Um, because from my understanding, if life is there, it's not that this will detect it, but they'll be able to do, get much, much closer to that answer. Um, and the other question I just had quickly for um, the, the group as well was, um, we know there's plenty of missions going to Mars, and the UAE one, as we've heard, and, 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 and the European Space Agency eventually. Can you just talk a little bit about how your science in, on this mission will complement the science going on elsewhere? I know you're talking, but it'd be interesting to know how you're complementing each other. Yeah, so I'll, I'll tackle your first question, and, and that's where I think we really get to some of the instruments and the scientific payload that we have on Perseverance, and those, those instruments on the end of the rover's arm that have the ability to map in very fine detail chemical composition, mineralogy, and the presence of organic carbon in a way that, that we've never been able to do before. As, as you may know, Curiosity has the ability to detect organic carbon, and it has detected organic carbon, but we haven't been able to necessarily link the presence of that carbon, uh, organic, organic carbon and organics, to a particular textures or, or, or patterns that we see in the rock that we think could have been left behind by life. And so it's really that connection of the textures and the composition that allow us to, to make a compelling case for a biosignature. And the instruments on Perseverance allow us to do that really for the first time on the surface of Mars. In, in a non-destructive way, um, also in the way that we collect our samples. Instead of grinding the rocks into powders, we're actually collecting preserved cores of rock that we can bring back to Earth and study. So I think that's really how we distinguish ourselves in, in, in advancing uh, the search for potential biosignatures on, on, on the planet Mars. Um, and maybe um, I'll, I'll toss it to Lori or, or, or someone else uh, in, the, in the panel to answer the second part. Yeah, I'll, I'm happy to take the second part of that question. Thanks. Uh, so yes, as you mentioned, uh, there will be several missions headed to Mars, uh, several this summer, and then of course European Space Agency in two years as they postpone the launch of the ExoMars rover. Uh, but this summer, of course, uh, China's going to be sending uh, their first lander to Mars. We're all going to be watching that very, very carefully. This is an incredibly difficult thing to do to land safely on Mars. We know how challenging it is. We've had our own struggles in the past. Uh, we've been very lucky and been and learned a lot from those. Uh, and and are, you know, we've we've been successful the last several times. So you know, I have full confidence in our team this year. But it'll be interesting to watch as as China attempts this as well. Um, so that that'll be an interesting thing to watch. Uh, the United Arab, Emir uh, Arab Emirates, of course, are sending their uh, orbiter, the Hope orbiter. Uh, 
this will be their first foray really into this interplanetary flight. So trying to uh, build something that can do science in orbit around Mars, I think will be very complementary to the other orbital missions that we already have at Mars as well to complement those activities. And then of course uh, the European ExoMars rover, when it arrives, uh, is very complementary to, uh, to what Perseverance will be doing on the surface. One of the things that the ExoMars rover will be doing that uh, is, is a little different than what we're doing with, with Perseverance is it has the capability to actually drill um, a couple meters below the surface to pull up a sample. And this is really important because uh, the samples at the surface have been exposed to radiation, and if there were actually life present on Mars at the surface, it, it may not, it may have been destroyed through that radiation. But samples beneath the surface may actually still have a potential uh, to contain some actual extant life. So there's going to be a very interesting complementary the, complementarity there between the ExoMars rover and, and Perseverance. Great. Thank you, Lori. And unfortunately, we can't answer all the media questions on air. For those of you with additional questions, please call JPL's Digital News and Media Office, and we'll also continue to answer questions of social media online right now. So thank you for your questions, and thank you to our panelists for joining us today. Perseverance is targeted to launch from Cape Canaveral, Florida on July 20th. It will land on Mars in February of 2021. You can follow at at NASA Persevere to keep up with its launch and journey to the Red Planet. And join our conversation by using the hashtag Countdown to Mars. You can also visit nasa.gov slash perseverance and mars.nasa.gov slash perseverance. For all of you interested in a deeper dive, we also have a new press kit available online, and it is filled with information and graphics describing the rover and mission and can help ask, answer any questions you might have. All the images you saw today will replay after this briefing. Thanks for watching.